Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, I find it difficult to stand up here for several reasons. One, I get really nervous when I'm up here. Anybody else nervous for me? <laughs> Afraid of what I'm going to say? Um, but I'm going to share some of my stories today, and some of them I'm not very proud of. Some of them I am, but each of these stories are about times when God has transformed my life as he continues to transform me, and that's what I want to talk about today is transformation. I think it's critical for us as Christians to continually focus on transforming our lives. We want to continue to grow spiritually. And I think it's important for us to share our struggles and, and to share our victories with one another. It's important that we share that faith journey because it helps us to realize that we're not on this path by ourselves. Don't you dare believe that whatever your struggle is, whatever issue you're dealing with in your life today, that there's not somebody else probably in this room that's dealing with the same struggle. And hopefully somebody in this room has gone through that struggle and is able to help you and walk with you through that struggle. But if we don't share those things with one another, and we don't know about them, and we can't help each other. We've got to share. So by sharing some of my journey today, some of my transformation, maybe it'll help us to relate to each other better. So I want to look at some verses, first of all, about transformation. And I believe that our transformation begins when we're saved. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. This sense of being made new or beginning, it's not a one-time thing. Yes, I believe you become a new person when you're baptized at that moment of salvation, but Paul says that the new life has begun. He doesn't say that your new life is finished, that you're completely transformed. And so I believe that it's an ongoing change that we have throughout our Christian life. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul's telling us that once we're, once we're saved, that we're now God's handiwork. We're his work project. We're his clay for him to mold. God wants to, he has plans for us that he wants to mold us to. And so as we have that love from God, I think he's able to mold us and transform us to be able to do the works and to serve in his kingdom. So let me just... I'm going to start my story all the way back in 1981, uh, I guess. <laughs> um, I met Terry Sue in college at Texas Tech. We met in August of uh, that year, and by December we were engaged to 18-year-olds uh, engaged in, um, you know, my dad said, well, we waited a whole year to be married, so we were 19 by the time we got married. But I remember my dad saying, well, how are you going to provide for your family? And I said, well, I'm a Pizza Hut shift supervisor, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to climb the Pizza Hut chain, I guess, and maybe I'll be a store manager someday or something. And so my dad said, well, have you thought about the military? And uh, my brother, my oldest brother, was in the Navy having a wonderful career, so I joined the Navy. And uh, they told me I qualified for their nuclear power program, which all I saw was dollar signs, to be honest. I had no interest in nuclear power, but I was like, this sounds like this will 
make a lot of money for me. <laughs> so I signed up. We moved to Orlando. We got married just after boot camp. We moved to Orlando. We were there for about a year. That's where they have what we call nuke school. Um, it's about six months of classroom. It's three years of college packed into six months. And I did okay. I'm pretty good at classroom work, so I did all right there. I remember that Terry Sue and I discussed church. We discussed our our faith. I grew up, my dad was a, was a Baptist preacher, and so I guess I would say I have a Baptist background. She grew up as Church of Christ. Um, we discussed about what church would we go to and things like that. And I remember saying, well, when we have children, it'll be important to raise them in the church. Now, the trouble was, Brandon didn't come along for 13 years, and so um, we never darkened the door of a church that I can recall for a long time when we were first married. 1983, we moved to upstate New York. There, you had to go to a land-based reactor and work there for six months. And uh, I didn't do so well. <laughs> Anybody who knows me, I'm not one to um, work on your car or work on anything mechanically. I'm not mechanically inclined. The Navy seemed to think I was, but... Um, so I was failing, and I was falling behind. In fact, I was the furthest behind that I could be without getting dropped out of the program. I would have still been in the Navy, by the way. It wouldn't have been, I would have just not been in the nuclear power program. But, uh, so I start hanging out with the other men who were falling behind as well. You know, we kind of do that a lot of times. We seek people that are at our own level. And so there was a lot of negative talk. Some of them didn't want to be there. And so I was trying. I just didn't have the aptitude to learn it as easily as I needed to. But I remember hanging out with these guys. And I don't know if one of them said it, but they planted a thought or I had a thought planted in my mind that I'm going to fail. Proverbs 18.24 says, some friends, I put friends in quotes, some friends may ruin you, but a real friend will be more loyal than a brother. So these weren't real friends of mine. These were acquaintances that, you know, I had to hang out with eight hours a day <laughs> or longer. But I got this thought that I was going to fail. I'm not going to make it through nuclear power school. And I allowed those thoughts to build. And so I built on that. I said, I'm going to be, I hate to use the word, I'm going to be a loser, right? I'm going to be branded. Terry Sue, therefore, is not going to love me because I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I felt like I could breathe that word in and out. Ooh, sir. Ooh, sir. So I continued to build on that. And I said, well, if she's not going to love me and I'm such a loser, I need to change. I need to be somebody different. And so I made this real adult decision at 20 years old that I'm just going to run away. I'm going to leave my wife, I'm going to leave my family, I'm going to run from the Navy. Knowing that, in my mind, I even began to glamorize it, right? This is going to be fun to live life on the run. I can be whoever I want to be, thinking that I could change myself. Never being able to see your family again. How could I make that decision? Never being able to see my wife again. Mark 7, 21 says, All these evil things begin inside people. In the mind. Evil thoughts. Sexual sins. Stealing. Murder. Adultery. And the list goes on. It says, All these evil things come from inside and make people unclean. See, I was allowing these evil thoughts, these wrong thoughts, these impure thoughts to cultivate and to grow in my mind. Proverbs 23, 7 says, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Probably like Nathan, whatever he's talking about happens to be a favorite verse, but as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, we don't think with this heart. We think with this heart. As a man thinks in his heart, 
So is he. But when we allow thoughts, when we allow them to brew, when we allow evil thoughts, thoughts about sexual temptation, thoughts about stealing and murder and adultery, then these things can become strongholds in our mind. And it starts when we just let it linger, when we linger on a thought a little bit longer than we should. We're all going to have impure thoughts from time to time. It's how we handle those. We can't let it progress to being a stronghold. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 that we have the power to demolish strongholds. And we've got to take captive every thought. 2 Corinthians 10, I'm going to start in verse 3. Paul says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the word of God. We take captive every thought. We take captive every thought. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. He didn't just say that we take captive our evil thoughts. He said we take captive every thought. So there are thoughts that we have that may seem harmless on the surface, but when we look back, if we continue down where those thoughts lead us, a lot of times it can lead us away from the truth of God's word and take us in the wrong direction down that spiritual journey and that transformation. But back to my story, I didn't take captive those thoughts. I let them grow. I let them fester. And so one night I was working the night shift, and uh, I kissed my beautiful bride goodbye. I went to the bank, took out most all the money. I was such a wonderful person. I left her. I don't know, maybe $200. And I was headed for Atlantic City. <laughs> Everybody, I was in upstate New York, so I was like, they're going to think I'm headed for Canada, right? So I'm going to be smart. I'm going to go to Atlantic City. I don't know. It sounded like a place with a lot of seedy people that could help me uh, live a life on the lamb, I guess. So um, I was working the night shift, so I left. I made it about two hours to Albany, New York. I remember going to a mall. I walked around for a little while. I went and watched a movie. We got a hotel room because I was not good at driving at night. You could ask anybody who knew me back then, even if I'm fully rested. I was behind the wheel for five minutes and I was asleep. So we got a hotel room. And I can clearly remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Though it wasn't audible, it was as if he was screaming. And I don't know exactly what he said, but here's what I heard. What are you doing? So I got up, got back in the car. I don't recall driving back to Boston Spa was a little town that uh, the Navy had us in. But I think God drove me back that night. We got back, as I pulled into town, the police surrounded my car. <laughs> this is a little town, they didn't have anything else to do, I guess. But, um, so they stopped me and they said, um, you know, you've got to go see the Navy. I said, I, I need to go see my wife. Because I don't believe I was coming back for the Navy, really. I was coming back for Terry Sue. They said, no, you have to go to the Navy. Uh, we'll let Terry Sue know. And so, um, you know, I went and things didn't go so well with the Navy. <laughs> they weren't too happy with me. Um, but a side note, I did make it through nuclear power school. There were some men there that realized I was trying, and they helped me, and I made it through. Um, what I learned, the transformation that happened, was, one, I learned that my parents loved me. And I grew up in a very loving home. But I never heard those words from my parents until that happened. I remember now we tell each other we love each other. I learned that Terry loved me. I don't know if she remembers. She said that I would have gone with you. 
truth is, she would have talked me out of it, right? <laughs> but she said, I would have gone with you. I realized that she loved me. It would have been real easy at that point for her to say, you know, I'm, I'm a year and a half into this marriage, and I'm married to a fool. This guy's an idiot. I need to get out of here while the getting's good. But uh, getting ready to celebrate our 39th anniversary, so I guess she saw something in me. Several years passed, you know, as my life is now being transformed, we're still not active in the church, but we moved out to Washington State a few years later, a little town called Port Orchard, Washington, about 5,000 people. I moved Terry Sue out there, and then I went to the ship, and I was on the USS Nimitz. We went out to sea for six months. There's 5,000 people on the ship, so we were the same size as this little town. But uh, Terry walked down the there was a little path near our house. She walked down it to see where it went. It led to a little Church of Christ. She went there. The preacher there was from our hometown of Lubbock, Melvin Bird. And uh, she fell in love with that little church. They started sending me cards and letters, you know, Valentines. They started sending me um, the sermons on tape. And I remember listening to those, and I liked what I was hearing from Melvin I would compare it to the Bible, and I was pulling the Bible out and listening to what he had to say, and I was agreeing, and I felt like he was preaching the true word of God. But there's still that, I, when I would get letters from her, and any guys that have been in the military, you know, you get letters, and a lot of the letters kind of like, here's what's going on in my regular life. You know, I went to the store today, and here's what the dogs and the kids are doing. But her letters would just light up when she'd talk about what was happening in the church in her life, and so I could see how much, how special this was to her, and I'm scared. I'm like, what if I don't like this church? What if I don't, you know, just a lot of doubt in my mind, and I flew in after a six-month deployment, hadn't seen her for six months. I flew in on a Sunday morning, and guess where we went? We went straight to the church building. It was bring a friend to church day, wasn't it? <laughs> so she brought a friend to church that day, and they just embraced me, and, and I fell in love with that little church, and it was a very big part, a very important part of our transformation as that church brought us back into being a part of a church, of a, of a congregation. And not all was good. We were in and out of churches for the next 10 years. Um, we ended up back in Virginia. We attended some churches there. We, we were active in a couple of those say I had some bad habits still in my life that dated back to probably all the way back to middle school, and they had strongholds in my life, and, and figured out how to break free from those, because I was trying to do it myself. But of course, we've all got hang-ups and habits of sin in our lives, but fast forward, I'm now out of the Navy, and we're, we settled in the Washington, D.C. area, and make a long story story short, I'll just say, we adopted Brandon. We brought him home from the hospital when he was one day old. We moved back to Texas about six months later. We decided to move back to Lubbock since that's what we were familiar with, where we had grown up, and we joined the Green Lawn Church of Christ there in Lubbock. I don't think it was an immediate thing, but at some point shortly after we got there, and I saw Terry being transformed by that church. I saw how hungry she was for the word. And I slowly began to attend. I threw a paper route, so I used that as my excuse not to go to church a lot. Um, be honest. But I began to attend. We really loved Dale Manning and his family, and he was the preacher there. And as I saw her growing, as I saw Terry Sue changing and studying the Bible, I wanted that too. And so I allowed myself to be transformed. And there were a couple of, I would say, a couple of major things that transformed us while we were at Greenlawn. One, we became active in the church. We became active in the ministries within the church there. Um, and then I would say, at least for me, that I developed a lot of Friendships with Christian men that extended beyond the walls of the church building. 
You know, in Hebrews chapter 10, it tells us that we should come together and we shouldn't uh, forsake the assembling, that we should be here because we encourage one another. And so by being an active member of the church, we're able to receive the benefits of worship and spiritual growth. You know, I was recently talking, I guess last Christmas or maybe Thanksgiving with my brothers about our spiritual uh, paths that our lives had taken, especially with dad being a preacher and uh, how that's shaped us as, as kids. And being the youngest, maybe it had the, the most different impact on me, but I told my, one of my brothers, I said, what it boils down to, the reason um, is that I built relationships with men out in the church that extended beyond the church building. And because of that, and being around those men, that's what transformed me. And it wasn't those men, it's God that transforms us, but it's, it's, they're the tool that God used to transform my life because I was being exposed to godly men and godly principles that work in their lives. After several years here and there in uh, Lubbock, I lost my job. I was out of work for nine months. I always remember that. This is somewhere, this was late 2005, early 2006. And during that time, we did our best to remain faithful, and God met all of our needs beautifully, as he always does. I recall getting an electric bill while, we were, while I was out of work, and I opened it up, and it had a credit on it. And it said, you've overpaid your electric bill. And I was like, that's a God thing there, because either somebody in the church paid that, or they made a mistake, but... That was God's blessing for us. And that's just one of many examples. But we stood on Paul's promise in Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I became very active in one of their ministries. It was a local outreach. Here on Wednesday nights, we went out to a local park in a poor neighborhood near the church, and we passed out groceries. Sound familiar? <laughs> and um, we would pray with the people there, and I became very involved with that. I was working with Jack Cummings, who was the outreach minister, and that was greatly impacting me. I was loving doing that work. Also, at some point during that uh, time frame, that nine months when I was out of work, a friend invited me to um, higher ground out in Rio Dosa, which was a men's retreat. And uh, higher ground had a profound impact. <laughs> it did, and it still does. Those of y'all who've been, you know what I'm talking about. I don't mean to get emotional. I'm being one of the elders now. <laughs> You've ever noticed how emotional a lot of us elders tend to get when we think about our flock not caring for y'all. The hard ground transformed my life. Terry Sue says the man who came back from that weekend was a different man than the one who left. He was looking for me to be the spiritual leader of the family, and to that point, she was. She was the one that was on fire, that was studying. And at this point, I came back ready to be that leader of the household that she wanted and she willingly gave that to me. In James 5.16 it says, confess your faults, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So during that weekend of that retreat, I was able to surround myself with, with men who were willing to share their challenges, to share their victories, and I could share mine. I could openly talk with other men about the struggles that were going on in my life, and not just talk about them, but look into the Word of God and see what God's plan is for us and what path that He has laid out for us. And it was one of the most refreshing and emotional weekend I've ever been to in my life. And so... Again, that transformation is continuing. I finally stopped and started listening to God better. John 10, 27 says, My sheep 
listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So I started following Jesus more. I started listening more. I started looking for his light more. I was moving forward on my faith journey. I was still out of work at this point. I remember coming back and talking with some of the men in the congregation there at Greenlawn, and and they said, you should start looking for work outside of Lubbock. And I thought, well, there's no way that God wants to take me away from the good works that we're doing here within this congregation. We're involved with small groups and, and with the outreach ministry and some other things. And I was just like, there's no way he wants to take me away from that. But I began to put in resumes in other places. And lo and behold, job opportunity fell in my lap for us to move here to Austin, to the Austin area. Um, and I could tell a lot about that, and I probably have shared that many a time with people, but we had no house. We had we put in an application on a house, but we really didn't think we would get it because at the time our credit was horrible. And uh, so we loaded everything up, and uh, we were leaving Lubbock without a home, without money to stay in a hotel. How are we going to make this work? And I remember it was very tough for Terry at that time. I remember Dale, the preacher, came over and prayed with us and basically shoved us in the truck and said, you need to go. <laughs> You've got to trust God. You know, Abraham was called from his home in Haran. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's family and go to the land I will show you. And I'm in no way trying to compare myself to Abraham except to point out that when he obeyed God, when he listened to him, his life was transformed. <laughs> the world was transformed. And when I listened to God and I let him call me from Lubbock and bring us here 16 years ago, our life was transformed. We pulled into this area, I guess it was Cedar Park. We pulled into on a Sunday afternoon Right as church was letting out, I remember, we met a realtor that we didn't know somebody had connected us with, and he said, that house that you applied for, you got approved for it, so let's go see it and see if it meets your needs. <laughs> and some of y'all were at, have been at that house and know that um, it, it was beyond anything we could have imagined. And uh, that home, we were there seven or eight years probably. And it met, it was incredible like how God blessed us just by listening to him and being willing to step out on faith. A week later, we walked into this room right here on a Sunday night. There were probably 25, 30 people here, I guess. And uh, when we left that night, we went to the McLennan's or what was called Life Group at the time, Connect Group. And we've never left. I've always felt so at home here. Remember sitting down in the first few weeks we were here. Uh, Dane Boyles was our preacher at the time. I remember sitting down with him in his office. And I told him that I feel like God is calling me to work out said, it scares me to death. I don't like meeting people. I don't like talking to people. But I feel that that's what God's calling me to do. And of course, in my mind, I'm thinking about what we were doing in Lubbock and hoping we could do something along that line here. And I'll never forget that Dane took off his glasses and he looked at me across the desk. Now, remember, I was out of work for nine months before we got here. Dane didn't know that. He said, I've been praying for nine months for God to bring somebody here to work outreach with me. It still gives me goosebumps. Because all of a sudden you see the plan that God had laid out for you, the path that he was preparing. That time when I was out of work so that I could focus on that ministry, he even had a hand in me not having a job, obviously. He wanted me to be able to focus on my church work, and he said, I'll take care of you, but I have plans, not in Lubbock. I have plans for you and Leander. 
Going back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which God planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. So here he was, just, it, it just blows my mind how God works sometimes when we just listen and let that Holy Spirit talk to us and lead us. He knew full well what his plan was for me here in Leander. So as you look at the thread of your life, if you look at your journey, if you look at your, look back at the times when hopefully, you know, Nathan talked about glancing in the rearview mirror. When you glance back, I hope you can see those times where God has been at work in your life. Those faith building moments, those are the building blocks of your life. That's your transformation. And after two or three years being here, I'm out of work again. I guess I'm not a very employable person. I don't know. I'm out of work again, and again, God's meeting our needs in incredible ways. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, The Lord says, I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. Then you will call my name, you will come to me and pray for me, pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will search for me, and when you search for me with all your heart, you will find me. I will let you find me, says the Lord. God didn't say, I have an easy plan. He said, I have a good plan. So not everything that we experience in life is going to be fun or exciting. In fact, to me, when I look back, it's almost those times when I was hurting the most that he transformed my life the most. It's all part of God's plans. So there's a lot of things in the last 16 years as we've been members here that have transformed my life, but I just want to mention a few of them, and one of them is Connect Group. And if you're not part of the Connect group, sign up today, get involved, find a group for you. Because it can help transform your life. We built some wonderful relationships through Connect groups. So I say take that risk. Climb into somebody's life, not in an obtrusive way, but in a loving Christian way. Get involved with families. Get to know people. Get beyond that good to see you Sunday morning with people. About 10 years ago, we introduced us at a Connect Group meeting to Zeb and Samantha Schoen. That's been life transforming for the good. That's family. Family now. Teaching. Be willing to teach. Take a chance on teaching. It's not comfortable for a lot of us, but it can help transform your life. Daryl's given me the opportunity to be able to teach, and it's always been. Better for me than probably the people in the class. It's very much will help your spiritual growth. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how the food pantry has transformed my life. The people in the pantry have transformed my life, both the clients and the, the volunteers. But remember, outreach scared me. Starting the pantry scared me because I was going to have to talk to strangers. <laughs> Still scares me. I'm afraid to talk to people I know. <laughs> I was afraid. I wanted to stay in the boat. I wanted to stay in my comfort zone in that cocoon, just like all the apostles except for Peter, right? But Jesus was calling me to get out of the boat. He was calling you to get out of your boat. Because when we step out, when we focus on, on God, like, like Peter did, we can walk on water. We can accomplish great things. So find your ministry. Find out what is that good works that God has prepared for you. Step out of your boat. 
One more thing that's transformed me is daily Bible reading. There were times years ago where my Bible, wherever I laid it down on Sunday morning, was where it would be the next Sunday morning. And I've been reading with an accountability team for a several, couple of years, two and a half, three years now. It's been a little while. And I would just say, if you're not reading the Bible daily, tap somebody on the shoulder today, grab your friend, and say, will you be my accountability partner? Let's read through the scriptures together. Start wherever you want. I would recommend starting with the Gospels, but start whatever part of the Bible you'd love to be reading. And just read for 15, 20 minutes a day, and then just share that with the other person. I read this today. Both of you can do it. So as I wrap up, going back to New York, where I was so full of stinking thinking that I was willing to leave my, my wife, was willing to live my life on the run, so I thought. See, I let my mind dwell on wrong thoughts, on wrong ideas, and they were planted, whether I planted them, we know where they were planted, Satan planted them, but I let those seeds grow. I was wanting to be transformed into a new person. I wanted to transform myself and start over and become somebody different. And you know, when I look back, I have been transformed. Not because I was able to change myself, not by getting a new worldly identity, but because I found a new identity in Christ. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I hope y'all weren't thinking that I was in any way trying to brag about my walk. I um, had many a dark day in my life. There were days in my distant past that you wouldn't have recognized me as a child of God. I had plenty of faults, and God's still helping me work on many of those. But when I look back 10, 20, 30, almost 40 years ago now, I see a different man in the mirror. That man was very much worldly driven and concerned about what the world had for him and what he could take from the world. And I can see that faith journey that God's brought me through. And I hope you can see it in your life again. I hope that you see that transformation that's been happening and will continue to happen in your life. So share your journey story. Share it with others. Share your victories. And if you haven't had a chance to experience that transformation, then the waters of baptism are waiting this morning. So if you need to be baptized, if you have prayers that you'd like to, us to pray for you. Come now as we stand and sing.